Hi everyone and thank you for joining my presentation. In the next 20 minutes I'm going to talk about how I train my own AI models and how I did this without breaking the bank. But before I do this I want to quickly introduce myself. So I'm Maxime de Grief and I'm a designer here at GitHub. I'm originally uh, from Belgium but I have been living in the UK for over a decade. If you don't know where Belgium is, it's a small country between the UK, France and Germany and it's known for its beers, chocolate and waffles. Now you know who I am, I'm going to give a brief introduction into AI, the different models and then I'll give you some examples uh, when you should train your own model or when you shouldn't train your own model and then I'll run you through a fast and easy tutorial on how to train your own model and we'll end up with doing some final touches on your generated images. So now let's start with a introduction. So unless you have been living under a rock in the past year, you probably saw the word artificial intelligence popping up everywhere. Artificial intelligence means the simulation of human intelligence in machines that can learn, reason and perform tasks that typically require human-like understanding or cognitive abilities. If you're not familiar with this topic, I'm sure you heard of things like ChatGPT, which is a virtual assistant that you can communicate with to answer questions, provide information, or uh, it can also assist you with various tasks. In this case, it, I asked it to write me a Drake song about developers crying over linters and it gave me this answer. Oh yeah, I see you staring at your screen, lines of code that make you dream, but there's one thing that makes you scream, it's those linter warnings, they are so extreme. And while ChatGTP is the most popular example of artificial intelligence today, there's also AI models that can output images. And if you did something like that, you're probably familiar with one of the tools that I'm showing over here. The first one is OpenAI's DALI, then you have Midjourney, and then you have Stable Diffusion by Stability AI. There are rumors that Midjourney is based on Stable Diffusion, but I have not been able to verify this through their own uh, website. And uh, an important different difference is that Stable Diffusion is a open source model, which I will come back uh, later on. But I want to clarify that I say open source model because the code to uh, train that model has not been open source. So it's just the model. And for example, uh, what can you do using, using those tools that I've just mentioned? Um, you can see here, I wanted inspiration for it, the next Pixar movie about a dog obsessed about Belgian waffles. So I wrote a few words, in this case, Pixar dog eating a Belgian waffle in front of a city skyline. And after a few seconds, I have a concept for a new Pixar movie. And it also can generate photorealistic images like this. Uh, for example, I used a uh, prompt that says mixed race male with black hair, 20 years old, in a studio with pastel color backdrop, perfect focus and film grain. And as you can see, it does already do a great job at generating those images today. And all those tools like ChatGTP, Stable Diffusion, Midjourney and DALI all are generative models to output new data based on a given prompt. But it's important to note that there's a difference between uh, the models. ChatGTP is based on a large language model, which is um, a artificial intelligence system that can understand and generate human-like language at a high level of complexity and nuance, while uh, Stable Diffusion, DALI and Midjourney are based on a latent diffusion model, which means it learns a sequence of diffusion steps to generate data from a random noise vector in a probabilistic manner, allowing for the generation of diverse and high quality samples. And that could be images, music, speech, and so on. And after reading this last paragraph, you're probably more confused than ever. So uh, let's simplify that a bit to keep this presentation a bit lighter. Um, so for the rest of this presentation, I'm gonna refer to them as a text-to-text -text model or a text-to-image model. And like I said, like latent uh, diffusion models, they can output also music or speech. Um, but for this presentation, we'll focus on images. So um, let's just call them a text to image model. 
One thing that's important here to understand is that those models that I've just mentioned are generally very expensive to train. And that's not because you need a lot of people or a huge data set, but rather because you need the infrastructure for it. And you can see here, I mentioned this costs often millions. For example, OpenAI's founder, Sam Altman, told The Wire that they spent over $100 million on training their latest model. And the reason for that uh, is likely because they needed access to 10,000 GPUs. Uh, each GPU unit almost cost $10,000. So you're quickly looking at about $100 million. And that's just for setting up or renting your infrastructure to start training a model um, that could become as powerful as the uh, ChatGPT4. The good news is that this technology is rapidly improving and therefore it's likely that today this would only cost like 50 million, so half of it, um, and the year after probably it will be like 25 million, like let's see uh, what's gonna happen. Um, but yeah, it's improving a lot. If you don't know what a GPU is, um, it's a graphical processing unit and if you look in a gamer's PC, there's often a little uh, window on that on that PC that you can look through. You'll often see one of those cards sitting in that computer. So the takeaway here is don't try to train a complex generative model yourself from scratch and, and just leave it to the professionals. But it's not all bad news. You can fine tune existing models. And this means using pre, uh, using a pre-trained model and updating its parameters on a smaller data set to adapt it to a specific task or domain, such as generating, uh, generating images of a particular type or style. And what gets really interesting here is that open source models make it super easy because you can start doing this without any restrictions. I remember when I showed you the different models that were available for text to image models, Stable Diffusion is one of those that uh, got open sourced and that allows me to fine tune it however I want. And there's already many great fine tune models out there uh, that you can find online. For example, this is a Studio Ghibli model that consistently creates beautiful Totoro style images. This is the chart in a beta that creates character artwork. You could, you could use that for uh, making games or, or mangas and so on. And then this model creates miniature worlds. Again, look absolutely amazing. And then this last model generates vector art in a very red tinted style, which is called Bloodstained. The question is, when should I create a model myself? Because earlier I showed you the Pixar dog and I think we can all agree that it looked quite good already. So should I fine tune a model myself? Well, I think there's multiple clear cases for training your own model. This could be because you want to train a model to a specific face or a style or reduce mistakes mistakes it makes in representing something. And I'm gonna dive into a few examples. So say I want to generate AI images of my dog. Should I train a AI model for that? I'll give you 10 seconds to think about this yourself. And just to clarify, this is not my dog. This is the dog that I want. The answer is Yes, because the model is not trained on the data of your particular dog. Defining the breed would likely work, but often a dog has distinctive features. And if you're gonna output a photo of your dog, I'm sure you'll see instantly if it's your dog or not. So therefore you do wanna train a model specific on your dog. Next is Pedro Pascal, should I true? Should you train your own model to output images of him? I'll give you 10 seconds. Right. The answer is yes. Um, so 
The so-claimed Internet Daddy might be very famous, but sadly, the models aren't optimized to represent individual celebrities. However, they will create similar looking people if you do use their name in your prompt. Um, but as you can see here, he doesn't really look exactly like him. Next is a hamburger. Should I train my own model for that? And the answer is nope. So generic objects are easy to create and especially hamburger, you can see I've created like two uh, examples that I generated through AI of hamburgers and I think they look uh, good enough. However, if you wanna represent a specific hamburger, like a Big Mac, you might want to train your own model because they have a distinctive look. Next is our favorite GitHub mascot called Mona. Should I train my own model or not? The answer is yes. Uh, the standard stable diffusion model isn't trained on this specific mascot and it definitely doesn't know a cat with a octopus like body so uh, therefore you will have to train a specific model for that so right now you get a rough id um, if you should train uh, or fine-tune your own model we're gonna do this, we're gonna create our own model. And for this presentation, I'm gonna create two models myself. In one model, we're gonna train Mona, our GitHub mascot. And in the other one, we're gonna train a style for avatars. The first thing we need is uh, training data. And the more, the better, as long the data is really consistent in what it represents. In general, 10 images should be enough to train a face. For a style, I would go like immediately to maybe like 50 to 100 images. We also need to crop those images to 512 by 512 pixels, and we have to give them a unique name that cannot conflict with a like meaning in the real world. So in this case, that unique name, I took ghconf because that's not uh, a word in the real world. World, sorry. And here you can see some Im images I collected to represent our Mona. You can see I tried to stick to a certain style, which is more that illustrative uh, version of Mona. And for the uh, avatars, I've collected uh, a lot of avatar images where the subject is always positioned in the center and it only consists out of photography and never illustrations. And a good to know tip is that you can also use existing models to like kind of generate your uh, training data. So you could use Midjourney, generate images out of there and then uh, fine tune stable diffusion using those images. Uh, so that means that you don't have to use images from on the internet. Next, we need a computer with a powerful GPU. The problem is that most Mac Macs are not capable of training AI because they don't have a uh, GPU often sitting in there. Obviously, if you have a more expensive like Mac, there's likely a uh, GPU in there, but even then they often are not powerful enough to do that work. So the way around that is using Google Collab, which gives you access to a clean environment where you can run Python code and use a strong and powerful GPU. So um, what can we compare Google Collab to? It's, you can kind of compare it to uh, a GitHub code space with the difference that Google Collab is powered by Jupyter Notebook uh, instead of VS Code. I recommend paying about $8 a month for Google Collab, but technically it should work on the free version as well. Um, but definitely the $8 worth if you're into this. Right, so in Chrome, we go to collab.research.google.com and you'll see something like this. There, you go to File, 
you click open notebook and then in the github tab fill in the above url uh, to open an existing ipython notebook file and this will avoid that we have to write a lot of code ourselves or fiddle around with dependencies uh, because we don't have that much time in this presentation to do this so now if you open this file, we'll review each individual block to make sure we have the uh, we have set the correct information. So start scrolling through this file. And the first thing you want to change is the model download section. There we're going to change the model version to uh, version 2.1512 pixels. And then uh, we go to create and load a session. And the session name, we're going to call it ghconf. Then in start dream boot, uh, in the start dream boot section, we're going to change the training steps to your total training data images uh, you've prepared multiplied by 100. If that goes above 1500, a final value, um, then uh, you're fine. If it's below it, because you only used about like 10 images and to multiply that by 100, that means you only have 1000 images, which is lower than 1500, then just bring it to 1500. And now we are ready to start running all the individual cells. So what you do is uh, you click this like play button that lives on the left of, of each individual cell and in chronologic order, you wait until uh, the play turns into a green tick. So it will go from play to a stop button and then to a green tick. And then you go to the next cell. There's a few cells you can ignore. For example, the captions, concept images and upload the train model. You can totally ignore those. But once you went through most of the cells, you'll bounce into this cell, which actually does the training work. And it will look like this once it's running for like a few minutes. And you will note uh, that there's like a green word that is at the back of the progress uh, bar. And that is the token that we'll use later to generate our images. Then once the training is done and you uh, play the next cell, uh, it will boot up a website to test our model. And there we're gonna generate images and see if the model that we've created looks good. So you click, uh, so you run the cell and then you click the URL that sh will show up after a few minutes. And when you click this, you'll uh, see something like this, which is a, a website that allows you to start generating images using our newly fine tuned model. The first input field is where we enter our prompt. In this, uh, in our case, uh, this is the most important thing. Um, and we should use the word ghconf there, which is the name of the images that we have used. Then below it, uh, there's an input field for negative text prompts. This allows me to remove certain things from the image. So say I don't wanna have black and white images, then you can add it in there by just, uh, and that allows you to exclude those things. And by excluding those things, the model will have a better understanding what you're after, and therefore you will start getting better results. In my case, I use black and white, weird colors, poorly drawn, bad art, disfigured. I didn't want to have 3D, so you can see I added that all in there. Then we have the sampling steps uh, that can be used to iterate more uh, when generating those images. Uh, however, I noticed like if you go above 60 steps, uh, it, the, the difference is like barely uh, noticeable anymore. And then there's the CFG scale. Um, that one basically means how closely it should follow the text prompts that we added in these first two input fields. And here are some results I received after cl clicking uh, generate. You can see uh, the prompt and the negative prompt I used for that. And you can see how quickly I got good results to create my own Star Wars inspired Mona images, especially the middle one is my favorite. It's like a Mona as a Jedi. And here are some more where I used uh, the Studio Ghibli style as inspiration for my prompt. So again, you can see Mona from the back uh, sitting in a, in a supermarket, uh, which I think is super cute. And here are some more where I tried to like push it even further, like what if Mona was a Pokemon or uh, what if Mona uh, was a manga character. So you can see that over here as well.
And the same works uh, for the style uh, model that, I, that I've created for the avatars. So you can see here how the image improved over the non-trained model. The lighting feels softer, the person is better positioned, and in general, the model generates more predictive images than the non-trained model. And here you can see some more examples I've created. You can see how I try to ensure I kept my model uh, diverse. And because uh, it's an avatar model, diversity is crucial to ensure everyone is represented. So you can see a few more images over here. And so now I showed you how we can generate images through our uh, own model that we have created. I want to dive into some final touches. So why do we want to chat about that? That's because often the images that are outputted by generative models contain mistakes. And if you look really well at this avatar I've generated, you might spot a few of those mistakes. First of all, the eyes don't look real, the shirt doesn't look real, and especially the eye has kind of like a, an odd gloss going over it. But the good news is there's a technique uh, called inpainting. And what is inpainting? It allows us to brush away a part of the image and regenerate that part of that image. So. I'm gonna show you how to do it. So you can access this feature through the same website we have booted up. So if you click at the top, uh, image to image, and then uh, in this case, let's replace the prompt with wool jumper, and then we click on in paint, um, and then we paint the area that we wanna see replaced then you can start regenerating the brushed areas until you're happy with the results. And you can see here after a few minutes that I already have much better results, especially the, the last three ones I think are getting much better. And I did the same for rendering the eyes again. So you can see here uh, how it had a harder time regenerating those eyes, but eventually after some trial and error, I landed on this final images. Uh, image, sorry. And you can see how it, this person has a much better shirt and the eyes look way more real. However, in painting is not foolproof. And you can see that if, I, I hope you can see it on the streaming, but if you look really well, there's kind of some artifacts around the areas that I painted in. And you can see that in the red, it looks a bit darker. And I have not found a great way to fix this with AI. So the fastest I still feel to fix this is using a tool like Photoshop. In my case, I use Pixelmator Pro to clean that up and brush away the artifacts that AI has created. So you can see here that AI isn't really necessarily the final solution. Everything still needs some sort of manual work involved to get the best results. And so here we are. We have created a great avatar, um, but let's be honest, it's very small, 512 pixel by 512. There isn't that much that you can do with it. And so we need to start looking at a technique called upsizing, where we resize the image to be larger. And we're gonna use AI for that as well. So again, available through that same website we booted up earlier, uh, but this time we click on extras, then we click uh, in upscaler one, S, R, G, A, N, 4, X, which stands for upscaling your image four times. And we click generate, and then you can see how I get, instead of a 512 uh, pixel image, I now have a 200, uh, 2048 pic uh, pixel image. And you can see, I still kind of have a lot of detail in the image. And so now you can see how we came from really far and kept iterating and resizing our image to get almost production quality images. Before I end my presentation, I also want to include this technique, which is image to image, where we give it a image and generate variants based on that image. And again, we can use the exact same website we used to generate our images, but this time we go to image to image and then uh, at the top, we enter the same prompt we used for that original image, but we switch a word up in this case. And I, in this case, will use a British female instead of a British male. Then I'll upload the uh, image, the original image that I, I created. 
and then I press generate and you can see on the right how I now have a female version for the same image. And especially for a uh, avatar library, this is great because you can see how I can quickly generate a diverse collection of people. An interesting fact, while I was working on generating those uh, images, I was watching the White Lotus and I spot the similarities with this actor. Uh, is it coincidence or was the original stable diffusion model trained on this actor? I guess we'll never know. And if you want to see more of my AI avatars, try out uh, my Figma plugin I've created called Tiny Faces. Uh, and if you don't use Figma, maybe you can check out a website called Tiny Faces uh, with a dot before the ES. And if you're still with me here, I thank you for staying around and I hope this will inspire you to play around with generative uh, image models yourself. Thank you. Bye.